You're welcome today to pull out your sermon handout for those uh, here, those watching online. Um, I don't, yes or no, is it, it's loaded up on their, our website. You can go to www.holytrinityeastpgh.com. Everything that you need is there and present, including sermon handouts, including sermons, links to the sermons at our YouTube page, as well as links to, obviously, our streaming service. If you found our streaming service today, chances are it's because you either bookmarked it at some point or you came to our website and were able to find that. So if you need any information, please always, always, always feel free to uh, go ahead and, and uh, to that website and, and download anything you want. Again, anybody from any other churches watching, you're welcome to give. Take any of the materials we put out there, claim it as your own. We don't really care as long as it gets used and where it makes us very happy. Uh, again, for our sermon for today, our lesson is from the book of John, the 14th chapter. And the lesson starts with this. Again, we're in the season of Easter, and so we have to think of a couple of things. The season of Easter is the time we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, what Christ wants to know, but also looks ahead towards the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so that theme is introduced here. In a couple of weeks, we'll be celebrating that gift that we are the gift of the Spirit in a season that we call Pentecost. So let me hear, let, let's hear the lesson for today. Jesus answered, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and he, we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but it is from the Father who has sent me. I've said these things to you while I'm still with you, but the Advocate, the Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you all the things that I've told to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. You have heard it said from the beginning that I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. And if you loved me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does, you might believe. Here ends the Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Bless our time, open up our hearts to your word and will this day we ask, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today, you notice there's a box right in the bottom or after the lesson that says there are important things in life and there are important things in life. Of course, the capital letters is meant to give it that emphasis. And there really are important things and important things. And we're going to talk about what the difference is between those. But I'm going to tell you that there are things that are important to me that may not be important to you. Things that bother me, see, things that hit me the wrong way and it just annoys me and grates on me. And, you know, one of them, well, it's not necessarily a thing that grates on me, but it's something that I just don't get and understand. And here I am going to probably offend and alienate a bunch of you already listening. I don't, I don't get tattoos. I don't get it. <laughs> I know some of you guys have them. I get it. I understand it. And, and you know, it's important to you and they mean something to you. I get it, and good for you, celebrate. I don't get it. My body is untattooed at this point and will remain untattooed the rest of my life because I just don't get it. It's not important to me. Okay? So I hope I don't offend you. It's important to you. It's not important to me. Or how about this? Have you ever seen those guys walking around with baggy pants, you know, it's halfway hanging down their hips or down their butts? I don't get it. Okay, now they look at me and say, I don't get your hair, bud. That's probably true. Of course, they probably don't say bud. But nevertheless, you know, they got their pants hanging around and they're just walking around and it just doesn't look good to me. I don't understand it. It can't feel good to have air conditioning down that way. I'm not, I'm not sure I get it. But nevertheless, it's not important to me. So I don't get it. I don't. I really don't. How about some of the other things? What else don't we get in life? Uh, oh, I don't. Hip-hop music? Don't get it. Doesn't, doesn't mean anything to me. One or two pieces here or there. If you like it, great for you. I happen to like classical music. I was listening to classical music today when I picked up Terry, and I've done that before with him, and he's kind of looked at me like, oh, okay, I'll change it. Well, he didn't look at me that way today. I just did because I said, oh, okay, I'll put on, we put on the Christian station often, and that's something we can agree on, and that's fantastic. But a lot of people don't get the fact that I like classical music. I like folk music, and people really don't get that. That's kind of crazy. Oh, you know what else I love? I love barbershop quartets. I used to sing in like three or four or five different barbershop quartets. I love that style of music, those tight four-part harmonies. Everybody else is saying, and you like this, why? 
because I just enjoy it. It's important to me. So all of these things that I like that are important to me may not be important to you. So they're important. Why? Because I like them. And you guys are all wrong. Okay, no, I'm just kidding, right? It's just not right. That's not a right attitude to have. But that's the type of attitude we have when we come to important things. And important things! So let me tell you what an important thing, little, lowercase is. These are those core values that we have in life that are important to me. There are buttons of mine that get pushed that set me off because I don't even know why. Maybe it's something I was brought up with. It's just a like and dislike or something that I have that I just think is really important to me. And they make my blood boil when people don't have the same likes and dislikes as I have. If they don't like the same movies as I have. If they don't love Star Trek the way that I do. If they don't love the Pit Panthers and hate the, uh, the, the uh, uh, whatever, that, what's that other blue team? Oh, I can't even say their name. Whatever that team is in Penn State, I don't know. You, you know, I don't understand people like Penn State. It drives me crazy because you guys are all wrong, okay? Right, do, you see, do you see how crazy my attitude is right now? But that's my attitude because those are my core values. It's important to me, okay? And it bothers me when people don't subscribe to my values. And maybe you feel the same way. But none of the things, not one of the things I just mentioned to you, are important for us to fulfill our purposes in life, are they? Not one of them are the thing that unites us as families. Not one of those things bring us all together today. And so that brings me up to the next thing. Then what really are the important things in life? The important capital I. Important. We know and I believe that the important things, the really important things are very few in number. One or two or three. And that's really about it. Nothing else is truly important in terms of salvation, in terms of the bigger purposes in life. These are the things that are necessary, at least in terms of the church. For us to be the church, they are the things that are necessary for us to be a church. And I know there are a lot of people that get caught up and say, we've got to have a budget, we've got to have a building. No, you don't have to have a budget to be a church. You don't have to have a building to be a church. You don't have to have a pastor to be a church. You don't have to have programs to be a church. You don't have to have youth ministry to be a church. All of those things are things that most people consider to be important to be a church. They're not. There's only one important thing that Jesus says is necessary for us to be the church of God. One. Ooh. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Because these things that are important in the life of the church are not personal preferences but they're related to our largest purpose as God's people. And so let's look at letter B on the second page. See, we get, up, we get really upset in our congregations about important things, little eyes. Back in the day, let me tell you some things that this church used to get upset about. Uh, let me see, one of the important things was women wearing dresses. Do you know that not one woman came to church today wearing a dress? Not one. And none of those ladies here today are wearing dresses. Back in the 50s, you would have been in deep trouble. You would have been looked upon as, I don't know what you've been looked upon, but kind of askance and kind of like this. And gosh, people would have really been offended by the fact that you weren't wearing a dress. Yes, that's true. But that's not really important to the life of the church, is it? Oh, let me tell you the other things that get our blood, gets our blood going as a church. The music choices that we make, the music style. Is that really all that important? I mean, there are churches that do traditional hymns. There are music churches that do scripture songs. There are some churches that don't do any music at all. Because they don't think the church is a place to do music. Worship furniture. Um, we have pews in our upstairs church. We've got seats down here. My mother-in-law's church, they actually took out the pews and put in chairs, and that really offended a lot of people because it was important to them. But here's my question. Is it about salvation, whether or not you have pews or not? Flags. Oh, we had a big blowout 
argument in our church back 20 plus years ago when I first came here about flags and the positioning of flags and how do you like the worship candles and I and I'm thinking is any of this really important well obviously it was to them but is it important in terms of salvation and then there are other things that get us going um, oh if you're upstairs in our sanctuary we have I'll tell you what gets pastors going do you want to hear how stupid we pastors are I'm going to tell those pastors we have upstairs in our sanctuary a picture of the Holy Spirit descending, which I get it's a theological act, theological expression of how the Spirit descended on the Spirit and how the Spirit descends on us. But if you go to some churches, some churches actually have an ascending spirit, a spirit that's coming right at you, or it's kind of flying all loose all over the place. And, and I think the, the representations of the Spirit, regardless of how they are, are fantastic. But I've been in meetings where Lutheran pastors sit there for three hours discussing how disdain, how, what, how, how horrible it is, how much they disdain any other picture of the Holy Spirit or representative of the Holy Spirit unless it's descending, if it's not descending. And I'm thinking, so we're spending three hours talking about whether or not your picture of the Spirit is descending or is flying all over the place, and that's what gets people going? Really? Or how about this? Does anybody know what I do with this after I'm done? Anybody? Ooh, Carissa does. Uh, some of the people that help me out sometimes with this. We take this wine. One of two things happens with the wine. It's either A, taken to Holy Communion to the shut-ins, or B, I take it and we dump it outside in the backyard. Why? Because we're giving back to God what the elements of the earth, what God first gave us from the elements of the earth. That's what happens to that. But you know there are pastors who sit here and argue for hours and get angry about the fact that we don't take this and we don't have uh, a little box in which we put and set aside and reserve all of the communion elements that are left over from Sunday in case we run out on a Sunday because then it's already blessed and then we can use it for communion. Does all this sound stupid to you? It should. Pastors get upset about these stupid things. And here's my question to those pastors who get really upset about whether or not you have host in reserve and put it in a box somewhere that you can use it when you run on a community. Who really cares? Is this a matter of salvation? Am I going to heaven or hell based on the fact of what I do with this Holy Communion meal after we're done with it? Am I? Is this a matter of salvation? If it's not, then it's not an important thing. Here's what Jesus says. In our lesson for today, I don't know if you heard this, Jesus says there's only one important thing. I want you to hear this word. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Not my words, plural, but very intentionally is it singular. My word, my one word, the one word I want you to know above all other words, it's the only word that's really ultimately important. John gets it, the author of our gospel lesson for today. As you might remember, we just spent a month and a half dealing with the book of 1 John. And if you remember the book of 1 John, it's all about one word. The same thing that's John's bias in the entire gospel of John. He wants to make sure that you understand this one word because it's what Jesus represents. It's who Jesus is. And what is that one word? It starts with an L and ends with an of. Oh, yeah, you got it. Love. That's right. Good for you. That one word that is above all other words, the word is love. Love is, loving Jesus is a prerequisite to love each other. If you want to understand how to love each other, you've got to first love Jesus. You have to understand the love of God for you. And Jesus goes on to say, if we do not love each other, it is because ultimately we don't love Jesus. I want to tell you a story. I am going to mention a name, and this is a name that I'm permitted to mention because she told me this before I die. Tell this story as often as you can. A woman in our church by the name of Ruby Cotler. I loved Ruby. Ruby was a tough lady. Though. She was one of those strong, hard-headed women who was her way or the highway. And if you're out of her graces, look out. She could make your life very miserable. But she was also a very giving person to people that she cared for. Now, there's one group of people that she didn't care for, and that was black people. 
She was a bigot. She hated black people with a dis, uh, she disdained them. And we ended up having uh, several black, black families, and we still have several black families in our church. And we had black families that joined our church back then when I first came here. And oh, did that get her going and get her gander up and get her mad with me. How can you let black people into this church? This church is going to hell in a handbasket. My parents and my grandparents would roll over in the grave if they knew were black people here. That's the type of thing that you would say to me. On and on and on. They've got their church to go to. Why are they here? This isn't their church. Those are the types of things that Ruby would say to me. We ended up having a woman named Marie Golden, who was, uh, and she's a great lady. She's still living. And just I just talked to her a couple of months ago and just about the story of Ruby. But Marie was one of the people who was coming to her church, and she would help out with her kids' club. I actually signed Ruby and Marie to work together in the kitchen. <laughs> That's what I did. And Marie, oh, God bless her. She was such a gentle soul. And Ruby, Ruby was just spitting tacks. Put me with that. Well, she didn't say black person. She used another word for it. That's how mad she was. Mm -hmm. You put me with that person. Spitting tacks. Ruby got sick. Death's door. She nearly died, came home, needed help. Her family... Yeah. Wasn't able to be there as often as she needed. She didn't know what to do. Guess who came over every single day to give her breakfast, to give her lunch, to give her dinner? That's right, Marie, this black woman who she called a lot of names. At the end of this, and I mean she was laid up for like six months. Six months. Ruby comes to me in tears and said, you know, I always hated black people. But there was a black woman who saved my life. I don't know what I would have done without her. She's the only person that loved me. And I treated her horrendously. But she just kept loving me. Her life was transformed by another person's love for her. When Ruby died, this was the coolest thing. I'm telling you, this is so cool. Ruby, before she died, she knew she was dying. She said, you know what, Pastor Dave... I want you to promise me you're going to do something for me. I said, what's that? When I die, and of course, whenever Ruby says that, you just hold your breath. You're like, oh boy, what are you going to make me promise her? She says, I want you to promise me that when I die, that Marie sits in the family pew right up front just to show people how my life was changed by Jesus. Whoa. I would say this, before Ruby loved this black woman for loving her, Ruby didn't really love Jesus. You hear what Jesus says? If you don't love each other, you don't love me. But when God got a hold of her life because of this wonderful black woman and transformed the way she thought, then she finally understood that word love and what it meant to love. When she was able to put aside all of her bigotries, and love the way that she was loved by God. Look at letter C. What about all those important things in the church? We know that love is the one thing. Now, before I go on with this, I know a lot of people say, what about Jesus? What about this? Do you do understand that Jesus is love, right? He's not just a messenger of love. Jesus is the love of God. So when I say love is the one and only important thing. I'm saying that Jesus is the one and only important thing because Jesus is the love of God, okay? Let's make sure we're talking about this in the right way. You cannot know love unless you know Jesus. And you cannot know Jesus unless you know love, okay? Jesus is the love of God, all right? So when I say that there is only one thing important in church, I'm talking about Jesus, I'm talking about love. But what about all those other things that we think are important? Our pews. Oh, our finances. Our youth groups. They must never, ever, ever take precedent over the one important thing. Ever. Now, you also need to understand that everybody gathered here today has a different set of priorities, different things that are important to them. And what we are called to do is accommodate each other. 
We disagree on many of the things that are important to us, but we must never disagree on the one thing that's truly important. What is it again? Jesus, love, I don't care which word you use, we're talking about the same thing. Jesus is the love of God. Love is Jesus. That is the one and only important thing in our church, the one and only important thing in life. And in the end, love is ultimately what defines us as the church of Christ. So I'm going to end with one more story. When I was a, in seminary, I, my first internship church was in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, there. So now you know where you get the O's. Sometimes I love the O's, and so I just kept the O's. I don't know. I love the O's. The Minnesotans are just wonderful people, but I was going to church as an intern pastor there, and um, I was in charge of the youth group. That's typically what interns do. So while I was in charge of the youth group, it was my job to help these 15 youth put on a youth Sunday. Now, I was still in seminary and learning and thought I knew everything there was to know about the church and about liturgy and so forth. After all, we are Lutheran and we do the liturgy the right way. And so I learned from some of the best professors in town to teach us how to do our <laughs> liturgy and how to lead worship. And so these kids were sitting here talking about what they're going to do for Youth Sunday. And I, ne I will never forget, they said, well, I think what we're going to do is, yeah, the Lord's Prayer, we pray it every Sunday, it's just boring. Let's change the words and make it our own and just change the way we'd like to say it. And I'm just like, <gasps> And then all of a sudden, well, let's put communion here instead of doing it there. And we're going to separate this prayer from that. But we're going to do this and that. And all of a sudden, my blood is starting to boil. And I, I literally, I blew a gasket. And I said, after enough, after like the fifth or sixth thing they decide they're going to do, I said, stop. And then they all look at me. And they jump like, what? I said, God, this is how I look. You can't do that. And they're like, remember. I've been at church. I've been at the, the seminary. I know liturgy. I know how this stuff is done. And they look at me and say, what are you talking about? I said, that, 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 that's, that's just not right. They said, why not? Actually, there was a girl. She was a real smart A-double-S, I'm telling you. She would look at me and she said, why not? I said, because we just don't do it that way. That's not the Lutheran. That's not the right way. That's not the, you know, that's not the way we do liturgy and so forth. And, she, and you know what? So she went on in her eloquent way of speaking to tell me that this is the attitude that really drives kids away. And you know, we just need to love each other. It's really not important. You're talking about some unimportant things. And actually, that's not what she said at all. She said, you're a dumbass. That's what she said to me. She said, you're really a dumbass. You know what? She was right. Because I was getting upset about things that were really not important. And as a consequence, what was I doing with those teenagers? I was pushing them away. How we do the liturgy, is that really important? Here, is people, are people's salvation dependent on us getting uh, all the T's crossed and all the I's dotted as far as our liturgy goes, as far as the music goes, as far as this goes? None of those things are important. There's how many important things does Jesus say? One. One important thing. And that's the love. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for teenagers who see us as we are sometimes. I often wonder what's happened to that girl. I don't even remember her name. I can see her, but I don't remember her name. And she had a great deal of wisdom. And I just thank you for that because it woke me up to what's truly important. What's truly important is love. The love of God in Jesus Christ. There is nothing else that's important. There may be personal preferences. And yes, God, there may be theological correct, theologically correct ways to worship that have been time-tested. And I get all that and I support all of that. I think it's fantastic. But if somebody doesn't worship that way, who cares? What's important is the love we have in Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for this. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.